and you're just scrolling through Facebook, that photo gets loaded through that library and then you get exploited. You don't even have to click on it, it just has to be in your Facebook feed. So that's really scary that all those people scrolling through cat videos on their Facebook feed can now be exploited. So something to think about, you know, there's all these apps on Android and now they're being owned. Exit interface. Thank you, that's what it's called. Exit interface. So does anyone know Rob Fuller, or most commonly known as Mubix? He's a guy who destroys Windows at ISTS and CCDC. Uh, he's really freaking smart. He has a web blog that I highly suggest that you guys go and look at. He has some really cool stuff. It's room362.com, I think. Um, and it's really cool. He has a lot of neat stuff. But this week, he just released uh, this project that he's kind of been working on, on, on how he used a turtle device. Uh, Turtle device is kind of like a rubber ducky, uh, for those who don't know. Um, and you can plug it into the computer in the back, and uh, the computer will recognize it as a device and automatically install the drivers and stuff for that device, which is really freaking scary because even if your computer is logged in or not logged in, it'll still install the driver because it's plug and play. So he was able to plug it in as a device uh, and then extract credentials uh, on uh, devices uh, such as Windows and Mac that are locked, uh, just locked. So if you're logged off, it doesn't work. But if you're like, if you just click lock, it will work. It'll bump the hashes and all that, and then you have to go back and crash and crack the actual hashes. So this is something to be aware of. Um, this is really cool that you can just plug in a device into any computer with an Ethernet port and just pull down the uh, actual hashes, which is something we'll be getting into next. Any questions? So, a uh, bit of a big news going on here. Um, I've been working on a project for about the past two months with a company called Quillcreate. Um, and what we're doing is a complete professional overhaul on, on all of RC3's designs, newsletters, that type of thing. So, I'm here announced today. Uh, we have an official new logo for RC3 going forward. Um, keep an eye out. We're also going to be having a newsletter uh, hopefully going out next week, and it looks fantastic. Um, but this is just something that we wanted to uh, announce to you guys to kind of show that we are working on moving forward, moving up, making this club a lot bigger and a lot better. So, RC4. Am I supposed to talk about Yes. I'm going to explain what RC4, but uh, Jamie was the actual creator and founder of RC4, so I thought since he's here with us today, we should kind of let him talk about it. This is my slides for the end, but I'll skip that now. Um, so, Hi, all you guys, new faces, familiar faces. Uh, I'm Jamie. Uh, I am. I was the president, vice president, and webmaster of RC3 when I was right here. I work for Grim, uh, and I'm here to announce RC4, uh, RIT's Competitive Cybersecurity Club Conference. So it is a really uh, unique thing that we started last. Was it two years ago? It was two years ago. We had the first kind of pilot one, and it was essentially to give our members a chance to present their ideas in a very safe space. So you get up in front of a group of people, you're worried about what do they think of me, is someone gonna call me out, is someone gonna you know, tell me I'm stupid, and then you're, you're standing up there really nervous, right? So we're trying to create an environment where that's all gone. Uh, essentially the format is in the morning, we're gonna do member presentations, uh, where you'll get up in front of room, you'll be paired up with people ahead of time that have similar interests, maybe paired up with an, an upperclassman that has some experience with the field that you're interested in, and then you'll come up, come up with a presentation. There's no pressure on it though, we don't release the groups, and if you can't, get together a presentation, that's okay. But get together a presentation and give it on that day. When you give it, questions are generally held till the, towards the end, everyone's pretty much required to pay attention. Uh, and then at the end, feedback, questions, um, all the feedback actually will go on an index card. So you'll do, um, you know, you write your feedback on an index card, and then it, all that feedback gets handed back to the presenters. So it's a very unique thing where you can get good feedback for your presentations, but not have to worry. It takes that kind of stress out of somebody being a jerk and like, you out during a presentation, which I know we're all terrified of. I'm still terrified of that. Quick, someone call me up. Um, so, what? Yeah. How about that? That's about that. <laughs> Uh, so that is the first part. There's more details to follow on that. Um, definitely uh, sign up for that. Um, you know, we, need, we need volunteers to present, you know, give your ideas. Even if you don't think it's, oh, I, I'm not a crazy hacker, I could never present. You can present on anything. Something, that, something that's extending, you know, something we covered in RC3, or something that you were just doing on the side, or anything you found in Kylinux, or something little. It could be at any length. So 
We have more details to come on that later. But the new thing we're introducing uh, this year is actually um, our alumni workshops. So in the afternoon, after the member presentations, we're actually going to have workshops done by alumni. I'm going to come in and give one, hopefully, uh, on anything from reverse engineering, pen testing, um, or you know, doing cool things with Python or something like that. Um, we'll still gather with those, but um, they will be for you guys so you can learn about some stuff that is actually used in industry from people that are in industry. So um, it's, it's going to be really exciting. Um, more to develop on that later. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to come back. And like Ben said, I was kind of the force behind the first one, and the second one uh, is, is my announcement tonight. So. so if you guys all know Brad, he's the guy that makes the demos for you guys every week. When he was a freshman, he talked about Wi Fi without <laughs> slots. Without slots. He got up there awesome. and just did it. Like, it can be about anything you want to talk about. Like, there is no pressure to be bringing up O-Days and showing everyone how you did it. Like, just call and present and share information with people. Show us what you're passionate about. Yeah. Something about so, security. Oh, we have this sign up right Just click on it. Uh, tell us who you are. Uh, tell us what your interest is. Tell us what you want to learn. And we'll try and pair up someone with who knows something that you may want to learn. Um, and we'll try and do that so that you're not out there presenting by yourself. You have a buddy. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, so, and our alumni workshops, uh, I mean, sorry, alumni training sessions. So the alumni um, have some ideas on stuff that they want to do, but if you have ideas, actually put them in that Google form as well, and they'll try and make a presentation and demo based on what you guys want as well. So one alumni is going to show you guys how to set up a home secure network. So he's going to show you how to do that. Uh, so things like that. Any ideas, write them in there, and our alumni will do it. So, so um, this past week, I heard uh, some people, some of the newer incoming freshmen were a little intimidated by the upperclassmen, um, just because we seem really smart to you guys. Um, and I want to try and clear any of that intimidation. The RC3 board and any part of our, anybody part of our C3 is here to help you guys. I'm not going to say that those are taking the dumb question, because we all know that kid who asks dumb questions during class, okay? One, I go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> No, yes. Well, when you're an adult, you guys are here in our team. This is one of the like, best colleges in the country. So I'm pretty sure you guys can make smart questions. And we'll provide a smart answer. So this is an expensive place to go if you already know everything. And that's why time is a thing. I really like this quote. The reason for time is everything doesn't happen at once. You can't learn everything, but you can explore everything. So have fun, ask questions, that's why we're here, to help you guys. Like, we were in the same seats that you guys were looking at us going, how do I get that position? Just ask us. We want to show you, we want to see you, we want to help you guys. So don't feel like uh, you're bothering us at 2 a.m. in the morning, if I'm on Slack, I'll help you out. So, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Things to keep in mind, to win prizes, teams must be no, no more than five people per team and no alumni. Must be current RIT students who go here. All right, the academic cloud, sorry guys, it's not up this week. Uh, unfortunately, I thought it would be, but it's not. Uh, the guy who runs the academic cloud is running a data center by himself. So he's got like a billion problems and we're kind of on the bottom of the list with all the other problems he's got. So uh, please be patient like us for this, uh, but shout out to him for all his hard work so far. Uh, so CPTC. Hello everybody, um, I'm Nick from West Virginia. I'm going to get the shirt today, as well as the plus to that thing. Um, CPTC is the Collegiate Penetration Testing Competition. Um, it was a competition that was started up and headed by Bill Stackpole, if you're familiar with him as a professor here uh, last year, focusing us on penetration testing. It's kind of like the flip side of CCDC. So CCDC is how well can you defend a network. Uh, CPTC is how well can you perform a penetration test on the network in a professional manner. So um, on competition day, you're given basically a black box network. You have a few means that you go on and you worm your way through the network, find whatever you can, and then present it to the judges in a professional way, um, as if you were a company that was hired by um, another company to perform penetration tests. Um, the event day is actually in two months. It's um, November 4th through the 6th. We have a much smaller time frame than uh, CCDC. Um, and I'm going to be putting out an interest Google form um, sometime today. It's going to be on our C3 Slack. Um, I'll pin the message there. It'll be on the Facebook page. It'll be on Sparse's page. Uh, pretty much anywhere I can get it. If you end up missing it, um, I'm probably going to have the department send out an email with the information as well. Um, John Weissman over there is one of our coaches. Um, we also have another coach, our newly brought on lecturer, Rob Olson. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you have um, questions, come to me, come to John, come to Rob, ask us questions. There will be tryouts sometime next week, probably Friday. Um, yeah, is that it?
Um, <laughs> I think we take up at least like 25% of our messages now. It, it's a group effort. It's a group effort. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning is a group effort. Yeah. All right, um, I like CTFs, I travel a lot. I was in London last week, it was fun. I'm um, going to Dubai, I don't know. Probably that weekend in London, in Kentucky. Um, so, who are you guys? So, raise your hands. Lizard, any lizard people in the room? Just me. Oh, you? Yes. Sick. I, I found it's fellow lizard people. Yeah. And computer nerds. Come on. Come on. Raise your hands. Yep, yeah, put them up. You're from here. Hackers. Any hackers? Got any hackers? Playing that? Hacking about me. Any reverse engineers? So, I like that stuff. It's fun. Freshmen. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Be afraid. Ah, okay. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. We do this club towards beginners. We do it towards all levels, but especially beginners. You guys drive us um, to be better. So thank you. <coughs> looking for co-ops. Anybody looking for co-ops? A lot of you guys probably. Right here. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> full time. Any full time people? Full time people. Hey, there we go. Okay. Hey. All right. So what is Grim? Uh, so Grim is a privately held security company. Uh, we have 22 full time employees right now. It's a very small company. 50% uh, commercial, 50% government. Uh, play both sides of the field. Both very different and excellent uh, things. Uh, great benefits. Uh, so perks of, of working for Grimm. Uh, unlimited vacation, obviously within reason. That's not like I just got my job and then I just took my salary and ran for two months. Um, that's, you know, if you need to take time off, you take time off as long as your work's done, the customer's happy. Um, so we're a, we're a contractor. Is, uh, I didn't put that on your board. We're a contractor. Uh, so unlimited vacation. Interesting, very interesting work. I've done some, some of the coolest stuff. Um, and the product I'm working on right now is especially cool, but if I told you about it, I'd be. Uh, so, well, it's amazing people. Um, they send you places to do training. I went to DEF CON. I got paid for a week at DEF CON uh, in Vegas, just like partying in Vegas. I mean, networking in Vegas. Um, that's because that's what you uh, Remote work, I worked remote uh, from full time remote from June until uh, just this past week. So, that's fun. Uh, most people work remote. Uh, and you're treated like an adult. I feel like a lot of times when you're new hiring a company, they treat you like the new guy, where you're just like, oh yeah, like you, you, here's this shitty project that you get to work on. No, um, I remember my first project was like I was writing a report for an auditing half, and as full time, I you know I'm the I'm the IT manager for my company right now. So like, uh, <laughs> like they don't treat you, they, they let you take on as much work as you want and show yourself. Um, so the, the kind of stuff we work on, uh, really wide range, um, application vulnerability assessment. Um, Web, any platform you can think of, pretty much. Software, hardware versus engineering, there's some really good guys. Um, if, you, if you know, uh, if anybody's watched Def Con, obviously there's a guy, his name is uh, Atlas, and he works for us, and he does a lot of car hacking stuff, and he's a pretty good Def Con presenter, so he's a really, really good guy. Um, development of tools, uh, and various things, penetration testing, not so much, but sometimes, um, that's, that'll, be, that'll be what I'm doing in, uh, in the month. Uh, and hardware, automotive hacking kind of stuff. So what do I do specifically? I have a lot of responsibilities at my job, actually. I'm responsible for relaying uh, Grimm's intentions with RC3 uh, and talking to you guys and keeping you interested and keeping you up to date on what we're doing uh, and hiring and things like that. Um, I'm actually the infrastructure IT manager, system and network architect, and help desk for my company. With 22 people, you kind of need, yeah, you're really not that much room for that. So I also am a full-time security person. Um, so I work, uh, I, work in, I, work, I work in a box. Um, it says at the bottom, we do special projects. Government stuff. Um, yeah, really fun. Uh, no windows, no phones, so that's fun. Um, so tool development, I'm all over this slide, but going in order makes sense for me. Uh, tool development, we have uh, one project on our GitHub right now, we're expanding that. Um, so we definitely keep, keep an eye on that star repo. Um, application development, um, when needed, and application assessment. Um, I do a lot of Android stuff, uh, so I'm not really a pro, but I guess I'm the go-to. I like poking Android until it breaks, like poking apps until they, they can do what I want. Um, so yeah, and I have one guy working on the new infrastructure, but um, I was able to come in and, and um, take our IT infrastructure that we had and then set it all up in Amazon and manage it. So I'm doing all that, which is really cool. I get, I get the, I have the power of, okay, I'm just gonna spit up a new box and test out a new service. So that's really nice. So we're in sponsorship. So what are we doing for RC3? Why are we sponsoring? Who cares? Uh, well, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard about the sponsorship that we're doing for the semester points. Um, so the first place, first two for our semester points in our challenge, weekly challenges, gets a free trip to ShmooCon, gets to hang out with us, um, gets to in party, I mean, enjoy the con without having to worry about uh, how to pay. Um, like I said, the security conference, uh, for those of you guys who have never um, been to a security conference, is essentially a big networking event with a bunch of talks and demos and you capture the flag and 
really, really smart people that you get to go and meet and like actually have conversations with. ShmooCon especially, it's a smaller conference. Um, so you'll get to go, you'll have a secured spot that's, I want to say about, I don't know how much you need it is, like 800 bucks probably to get in, hotel and travel. So that's a big, big thing. And then um, the first, the first play, uh, top score in June, you're a co-op offer right out and give it to you to work for us this summer. We're actually looking for three co-ops, including that one person that gets the offer. So um, you guys can talk to me about that. Um, we'll be looking at applications or resumes and things like that probably in um, early mid-spring. So uh, another thing, one person can win both of these things. So if you're a junior and you get the top score, then you're, uh, you're doing pretty well for yourself. So we're um, contributing challenges to the uh, CTF. We're also contributing money to the CTF and to C4 and to uh, IRSEC. So that's a good thing. And alumni flash talks. Well, I'll try to get uh, a couple more of my guys to um, come in and give talks. Um, so like I said, I'm the bridge between uh, Grim and RCP. So ask me. I don't know if you guys have any questions, if you just want to get on with the presentation, I know that um, you probably came here for technical stuff, and it's just a bunch of people talking about a bunch of events and shit, but um, if, you, if anyone has any questions, um, I'll take two or three right now, and then talk to me after, please. What's it like working for such a small company? I love it. Um, the, the big thing with Grim is we're all about um, these five things at the bottom, um, if, you, if you read that. Um, if, you, if you live by that, talk to me, honestly. Um, it's, it's nice being able to work with people that put their pride aside to get get done what needs to be done. You know, I have a guy that's been working in the field for 45 years, comes and asks me questions because he doesn't care because he, he wants to, he doesn't care about, you know, he's asking this young guy, oh, this young guy just came in and knows more than me. He's intimidated by that. He'll ask me and I'll help him and we all help each other. It's, it's a really amazing like environment to be in where there's like no barriers. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Cool. It varies. Uh, so uh, I, I, uh, I wake up, uh, look at myself in the mirror for about 20 minutes, contemplate if I'm really doing uh, what I want to do with my life, and then I say, yeah, because like, my job is kind of, I really like my job. Um, this week, I started a new project, and I go to work, and then I put my phone over here, and I go into a window screen for eight hours. Um, that's great. Awesome stuff, I can't say. Um, before that, um, I would uh, wake up, go on to bed around 10, Shower, start work around 11, or you know, maybe earlier than that, maybe flexible hours, doesn't really matter. Um, do work my PJs, do some infrastructure, uh, make some, do some scripts to snapshot VMs or something, uh, and then work on security testing. I do a lot of source code audit, so a lot of Android auditing, application auditing, source code audit, um, look over source code, try to find vulnerabilities, C, Java, Objective C, uh, those are my main ones. That gives you kind of an idea. It's really laid back, like make your own hours. I mean, I'm probably I can go in on Monday and work a weekend day, like whatever. If I can't, I mean, I'm working remote today. I can work in infrastructure today and then be in the office on Monday or Tuesday. So it's very laid back. Um, they treat you like an adult. Like I said, if you get your work done, you're all set. No one bothers you. <coughs> my my also my boss is one of the most welcome and people I know, so it's a really really great perk. So a little more than you ask for, but hopefully you guys take your success. Anyone else? I'll take a third one. And then. Traffic is a con. <laughs> I hate traffic. I, I, I went the wrong way. I was, I was, just, I decided to be a big boy. I tried to be a big boy yesterday, and finally I went to the Google Maps. And I drove three miles in the wrong direction, which ended up delaying me 15 minutes. So there's traffic on the way back. I have a reverse commute. Uh, I go uh, away from DC uh, in the morning and towards DC in the afternoon, which is usually the opposite. So I have less traffic than normal, um, but it's still annoying. It's still whenever you try to go anywhere. Um, but there's a lot of people in that area. There's a lot of people doing IT in that area. There's a lot of jobs in that area, and there's also a lot to do in that area. So those are the pros, I guess. Um, subway system's good too. I'm interested, so. All right. If you have any other questions, talk to me after, please. I'm looking forward to hearing from all you guys. Hit me up on Slack. I'm Wombo again. I won't go, you won't go, me, she, me, won't go, won't go, won't go, won't go, won't go.
store the public key on the remote server in that file, and then you have the SSA private key on your remote box, and then you just log into a normal server, uh, log into a uh, SSA that you normally would, it'll use that private key to authenticate you. Uh, if your uh, private key is in a different location than the default location, use the dash I and then the location of the file.
Venus tree that branches out to things called top level domains and then domain names that you guys purchase, um, kind of like this. So we have the root of the domain, which is a period. Okay? And then in the top level domain, you see top level domain names, you'll see things like .edu, so rit.edu, or .gov, .com, .net. Those are the top level. So what will happen is registrars, domain name registrars, people who sell domain names, will say, okay, I am authoritative, or I have the ability to sell things under the .com TLD. So if I want to make malwarelove.com, right, I go and I would buy that domain name, and they would say, okay, I got a record pointing to your server. Now, if anybody, whenever anybody says, I want to get to malwarelove.com, they go and they say, they ask their server to say, hey, where's that address? And that gets it to them. Going back a little bit. So, fully qualified domain names. Um, it's like a full path when you're trying to go in a file system. So you're in Linux, you want to get to the Etsy password file. Let's say you're in your home directory, which is in slash home. If you want to go and edit the file directly, you would say vim slash Etsy slash password, right? If it was in the local directory, you would say um, vim whatever your file name is, you wouldn't have to provide the full path. So when you're referencing things like in DNS servers, a lot of things really like to have fully qualified domain names so they know what you're actually talking about and not like part of a subdomain of what you have. Um, DNS normally runs on port 53. Um, it uses UDP for all uh, queries by standard. Um, and then it uses TCP for zone transfer. So if you have a master DNS server and a slave DNS server, um, the slave can pull a zone transfer from the master server to say, okay, what are these things? And you can have multiple servers that can serve the requests um, at the same time. So DNS, it can be either recursive or iterative. Recursive is just like, I ask you, hey, Ian, what's the IP address for that thing over there? And then he goes and gets the IP address and says, here you go, I got the IP address. Right? Iterative is where he says, hmm, I don't know the exact thing, so how about you go and talk to that guy over there? So like, what would happen is, if I wanted to find RIT.edu, I would ask my local um, domain server and say, hmm, I don't know about that. Let's go and see who is authoritative for the .edu domain, or the top level domain. It would go out to the root servers that are distributed across the world. Let's say, oh, okay, here's the address of the root server for the .edu domain, and it would do that, and then it would go and then say, okay, .edu server, do you have rit.edu's IP address? And it would say, yes, I have that. It's right here. Not really right there, but it's right there. So then if you were trying to get to www.rit.edu, it would then go to the rit.edu's DNS server and then say, okay, here's the IP address for that. Now that you have the IP address, you can go and get it. Recursive does all that work for you, whereas iterative is all the steps that the other machine is taking for you. So where it's saying, okay, here, no, go over there. Okay, here, no, go over there. And you follow the chain down. That's when you do it yourself. Recursive is if you ask um, DNS server over there, and then it does all the work for you, and then just gives you the final answer. I thought this said that really confusing, and double back on myself, but. Okay. Um, zone transfer is when you transfer records. So what I was talking about when you have the master and slave servers, um, let's say you have seven slave servers out publicly, and you have all the master servers sitting behind the <coughs> that protected zone. Um, the slave servers will be able to pull any changes to the DNS records, and then people can hit the DNS slave servers instead of the master servers to take the, um, take the attack service away from something that can actually be modified. Um, playing off of that, there are things called DNS updates. You can do them remotely. So you can go and you can update a master server by submitting the update command and you're authenticated properly. Um, but you can't do that to slave machines. Slave machines will only display back what they've been given from the master server. The master server can be updated and that's often why you want to have your master server um, firewall off so that it's only accepting updates from certain areas. So one quick thing to kind of keep in mind uh, just going back to DNS here real quick. DNS, uh, people kind of overlook it, but I don't want you guys to do that. It's a really powerful thing if you get access to a master uh, DNS. You can put an entry in for like bankofamerica.com, bankofamerica.com, 2.2 your server. And if you clone the web page of bankofamerica.com, and I am on that domain, and I'm using that 
DNS server that you poisoned with a DNS record, and I go to bankofmanner.com, I'm going to go to your server, put in my creds, and now you've got my bank account information. So DNS can be really powerful if used correctly. All right, cool. So Samba, SMB, NFS, they're all different services on the network that you can use for uh, file sharing. Uh, three ports here, uh, four ports. Uh, and the uh, parentheses are for uh, SMB, uh, 445 is for Samba, and then NFS is 2049. Uh, so network shares for Linux and Windows. Um, so Samba shares and NF shares uh, by default uh, have, don't require authentication. So they're just open shares by default. So unless you tell it to uh, do authentication, it will slow you to it. SMB shares require authentication but can be disabled. Uh, so that's really powerful because a lot of people use Windows, and I've been in networks where everyone shares the same drive, and there's no authentication. I've been in banks where that's happened. So think about that. Uh, your bank information's on a chair somewhere, and everyone's using that one, and there's no authentication. You just need to know where it's located. So open network shares can be used uh, for data and exfiltration on the local network, and to connect to those various services, those are the commands you would use. So, web, uh, Nick, did you want to talk about this one a little bit more? Since you're better at that, not great, but better. <laughs> okay, so you're probably all very familiar with the internet and what you see most often, which is web pages, right? Those run on two magical ports, 480 and 443. 443 is what HTTPS runs over, which is really just HTTP wrapped in SSL TLS, which provides encryption so that nobody can look at it and say, oh, I know you're reading the password page and you log on to yourbank.com. Um, a lot of things that can go wrong with web applications are the improper sanitization of input. So like, let's say we have a blog page, right? And um, we accept comments because people like to comment on blogs and stuff. Um, you go to the blog page and you say, oh, hey, your blog is really neat. This is really awesome. Put a HTML script tag in there and say, hey, I'll run this JavaScript and then close that out. If it isn't being sanitized properly and gets stored to the database, that JavaScript that then gets embedded into the page will automatically run on anyone's browser who goes to it because that's what browsers do. They just execute what's given to them. Um, so if you're being too permissive, um, that's something that can happen. You always want to do filtering and sanitization of what's coming in and encoding the data so that it doesn't actually execute certain contexts. Um, this is something that we're gonna cover a little more in depth in week 11 and 12, this is kind of just like a precursor to it. Um, alternate ports that um, you can probably run a web server on, or the default <laughs> alternate ports are probably like 8080, you'll see a lot, like a lot of things that just play off of the port number 80. Um, so some things that we can break for our server, um, well, if the web server is configured to run in like a privileged manner, so let's say you have a web server running as root, it's a bad idea to not do that. If you want to compile Apache so that it runs as root, you have to apply it, you have to compile it with dash dash big security hole. Right? <laughs> dash dash d big security hole. Um, so uh, if the website allows some sort of file upload, what you could do is you could upload something like a PHP shell. Right, so a little PHP file or whatever backend is running a file that comes from a web page that has, I don't know, like web functionality, not web functionality, like system level functionality. So an option that you could potentially run a shell or have it do certain commands like shut down the firewall, things like that. Click on the back. Um, and if it's running, whatever the web server is running as, that web shell will end up running as too. So if you have a web server running as root, you can get a web shell that's placed on that server. Any command that it executes will run as root. What's a web shell? What's a web shell? Oh, let's do that again. Um, basically, it is a, web, a small web application or a web page that you can upload to a web server and then perform functions on the system, such as navigating through directories, running commands, downloading files, um, modifying files and directories, and just generally bad things. 
websites that have usernames and logins, those are all stored in a database. So that's a good place to go look for usernames and hash passwords. Uh, also things like credit card information, SSA, email, and other types of private information are stored in databases. So uh, a way that you would interact with the database is you go mysql u the username, and if it has a password, which is, again, optional, because most of them do, some of them won't, um, you can use the dash P, and, uh, and then you type in the password. You can do show databases, we'll, we'll show you all the databases. We see that there's a credit card database, oh, that's really juicy. So we say, hey, let's use credit card database, or credit card DB, uh, and then once we're inside that database, it has tables, and then we're gonna say show table, and we can see that there's tables of credit cards. So we're gonna do select star from table, which will just print out all the contents of that table. So, one thing to keep in mind is the biggest weakness of all services will always be weak passwords. It doesn't matter what you do to secure it, if your user on that box has a weak password, that will always trump anything you ever do to try to secure a service. So keep that in mind. Weak passwords will always be the voice for anything you do. Uh, so again, how do we start with this? So step number one, like we learned last week, is scanning the enumeration. Let nmap target to determine what services are running. So you can use nmap-sb, the sb command will show you what services are running, and specifically what versions are running. Um, and then you can use this cool command called dash 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 uh, top port. And you, it takes uh, an integer from 10 to 100. And it has this set list of uh, all, the, all the top ports. So you can say, scan the top 10 ports. And it will just scan the top 10 most famous ports. Or the top 10 hundred. So you don't have to scan all of them. Or you can just be like, I want them all. So you can use this dash be dash. Um, and then you can go to Google and learn more about the service and how to interact with that service. Uh, Calibrate. So here's all the resources. There's a lot here. Um, Nick tried to do as good as he could with DNS, and he did a fantastic job. Uh, and network services, DNS takes four weeks to learn. We just compressed it to like three minutes. So DNS is huge. If you want to learn more about it, um, I've definitely uh, put a YouTube video um, about it, so you can go watch it. That's about 40 minutes. I'll do a good job. Uh, DNS sec, if you want to learn more about DNS and the security of it. Uh, Elon is security guy. He's a great guy. If you want to go back and get like a refresher on all the stuff that we talked about last week with TCP and IP. Um, and then these two top ones will show you how to create your own SSH keys and explain some public key code. Blank on five. So as easy as I can make it, gave you all those. Uh, know that GitHub Student Pack is a thing. Definitely go check it out. There's a lot of free services. Um, and you get it with the student GitHub free pack. Student uh, GitHub pack, you get a Namecheap.p domain free for one year. Or you can just buy 88 cents.xyz domains. I know for those, they increase up the first year. So, my suggestion for that is that they're probably always going to sell their, dot 88, their, their XYZs for 88 cents. So, what you do is you kind of let it expire and not really go in your domain for like two minutes, and then you just buy it for 88 cents again. So, so what that means is a registration for a DNS is kind of like registration for your car. So just let that registration expire for like 30 seconds. After it's expired, just go buy it again. So if it's like 30 seconds where you don't know you're on, where you don't own your domain and someone else could buy it, but it's really specific, chances of someone buying it are slim. So that's a trick to get around that. Let's see, you know, who's that way? Right? <laughs> but I'm willing to take it, so it's up to you. So uh, any questions? 